we are continuing on. How many of you are still on the Proverbs challenge? How? Good, because we're not done yet. <laughs> you should be. There's still another, say, about, what, 14 days left of it, and it's been, for me, so revealing to read through Proverbs. And, and in the office, we have this conversation about what part of this chapter should we highlight. And you, it's really so hard, because Proverbs is filled with so much wisdom and insight. There's just so much in there. Um, but this Proverbs challenge, I do want to encourage you, if, if you haven't started yet, you can start today. Proverbs 17, it's the, the, the day of the, on the calendar, that's the chapter you are on. And next month, you can start on the 1st of August, you can start with Proverbs 1. And keep doing that. I know quite a few people that read Proverbs the whole year. Uh, every day, they read the book of Proverbs. So, so you, can, you can really do that. Um, the theme is train your brain. That's the thought behind Proverbs. Um, because what we've discovered so far, and what I've discovered in reading, is that God wants us to gain wisdom. He wants you to have wisdom and understanding. The word wisdom, if you can remember, means what? How many of you can remember? Anybody? Chokhmah. That's the Hebrew word, how you would say it in English. If we had to translate it, we'd say chokhmah, because we don't say ch. Chokhmah, okay, so chokhmah means what? It means that I am an expert at living. Wisdom in the book of Proverbs means it is a person, a person who walks in wisdom is a person who walks as someone who is an expert in living. People can come to you and they can say to you, I want to know why you are living your life the way you are living it? Because it's different than what I see from other people. And it's because you have become an expert of living because you have wisdom. And not just worldly wisdom, godly wisdom. You are an expert in living. And the reason I say it's different is because we have to remember, God sees the big picture of everything that was created this is a big picture God. He, he knows how everything was put together because He's the one that put it together. He knows the insides and the outsides of it. He knows the consequence of decisions. He knows which paths leads where. He's outside of time. He can see what wisdom, where wisdom's going to lead you. He can see where the decisions you are going to make. He knows the path. He can see that path. He's got the wisdom of it. He knows the consequence of your decisions. That consequence is going to take you there. He knows this. So when Solomon asked God for wisdom, the wisdom that God gave him wasn't just, oh, this is a great idea from a great guy that was just super smart. This was Solomon saying, God, I want to have your understanding. So, so when, when I'm going to deal with people and the way I'm going to do life, I want to do it the way you would have done it. Give me that wisdom. Not from people around me that are counselors or good advice people. I want to have your thinking about every situation and circumstance. And that's how I want to lead your people. And that's how I want to instruct your people so they can become experts at living your way. So when we read the book of Proverbs, it is an extremely practical book. It is not, <clears throat> yes, we have a lot of spiritual wisdom in the book of Proverbs, but it was written with the mind of thinking, these are practical things you should do. It's not, oh, I'm praying about that. Oh, yeah, I'm just in the spirit with that. You know, I'm praying. No, he's like, no, so, no, do that. Don't just think about it. Do it. So true wisdom begins with God. It begins with God. You can't have it anywhere else. True wisdom. You can have wisdom. You can have insight. But true wisdom begins with God. It means that you have to be mindful of Him. It means... That your mind has to be full of Him. True wisdom is, is um, the decisions I'm making. The first place, and I'm not talking about, am I going to use the bathroom in this down the whole year or down the... I'm not talking about those decisions. I'm not talking about, you know, I'm gonna, am I going to brush my teeth for 30 seconds or a minute? No. True wisdom means I'm mindful of the decisions I'm making that's impacting my life and the people around me. 
I'm mindful of that. I'm mindful of where I'm going, what, what I'm instructing my children. I'm speaking to people. I'm mindful of my conversations I'm having. I'm mindful of what I post. Whoa. I'm mindful of what I watch. I'm mindful of how I respond. I'm mindful of how much I drink. I'm mindful of, is this reflecting who God is? I'm mindful of how much I eat. I'm mindful of those things because I want to have the heart and the mind of God. I'm mindful, I'm mindful like decisions. As, and, I, and I'm thankful because it feels like, man, it's, I know so many of you also. It feels like I'm getting to that place where my first place I go to with any decision is God. Like, I'm God, what are you saying? What do you think? What are your thoughts? And I don't have to have scripture memorized to have his thoughts because he lives in me. He lives in you. The decisions that you're making, you can go in a moment, in an instant. You can go, God, what are you saying? What are you thinking? What are you? And then what happens is God's peace, he, it guides us. It leads us. It helps, it helps us with our decision making, with our conduct, with our words. Now, um, as I said, as you will notice that the instructions is extremely practical. It's, it's the difference between watching somebody train the book of Proverbs and, and doing it yourself. It's like I've been, and just been in, uh, as a goalie now for 10 years. I've been to hundreds of goalie sessions. Based on what I've watched, I should be drafted. <laughs> should be. Like, Canuck should go after me, like, no doubt. Or a team that needs a goalie, Toronto or Calgary or Edmonton. Um, right? Any of those teams, they should come after me because the amount of goalie training I've watched, crazy. But the amount of goalie practices I've participated in, do you know how many? Nothing. <laughs> Zero. Not one. If you put me on the ice and goalie skates with, a, with pads, I will be lying in front of the net. Even though I know what I should be doing, but I've never put it into practice. And this is the book of Proverbs. You can read it, read it, read it, read it. Unless you put it into practice, you are like somebody, like that backseat driver. Oh, we love them. <laughs> right? You love those. Yeah, so don't be a backseat driver in church. And we see this, like, as leaders of the church. Like, we have constantly people telling us what we should do. And then we ask them, where are you serving? Where are you digging and sowing into people's lives? And they are innocent bystanders just wanting to help us to lead the congregation in the right direction. It's like watching goalie training. Right? Yeah. So, four main ideas. You don't have to agree. I've got the microphone. Um, there are four main ideas I have discovered in the book of Proverbs, and we looked at the first one last week, the fear of the Lord. Now, I don't know, I wasn't here, but I presume that you guys felt God speaking to you in that message, because it speaks to me. Like, the fear of the Lord is significant. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Solomon starts with that. He's saying, I'm going to give you all the instructions in the world on how to do life, everything else. I'm going to give you a big picture of the idea how the world functions, how you can be an expert in life. I'm going to give you all of that. But none of the information I'm going to give you will matter unless you have the fear of the Lord in your life. So this is something that we should nurture. And we, we explain fear of the Lord means reverence, honor, awe of God. God, you are elevated above me. Your thoughts are higher than mine. Your ways are higher than mine. My mindset when I think about him is he is God. I am not. People are not. Culture is not. He is above all things. Unless we have that in our hearts and in our minds and the way we do things, what happens is the instructions, you will become a casual instruction follower that casually pick and choose which one of these things you feel you like. But when the fear of the Lord is there, you don't pick and choose because you revere Him, you honor Him, you do all the things His way. And that's where we, we have to be at as a church. 
And it's the fear of God versus the fear of man. If you fear the Lord, you don't have to be afraid of any person. Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. This is a grid. You know, um, when you read Solomon later on, you see that Solomon went off path. You know why? He stopped having the fear of the Lord. It's the easiest sidetrack for the enemy is to get us to listen to opinions. He had all these wives um, and concubines and, and that were surrounding him. And he started listening to the gods of the wives that he had, worldly influence, Baal influence, and he lost his mind. The fear of the Lord is like a grid. It's like, a, it's like barriers on a road that keeps you on track. If you feel like you've gone off track, I want to encourage you, start in your prayer life just by honoring God more. It's, it's a simple thing. You know, when, when I was younger, we used to pray. My dad always said, you know, you have to, for prayer, we had to kneel next to our beds. How many of you had to do that? Kneel next to your beds, you know, hands folded at the front. And, and as I moved out of the Dutch Reformed Church into to into my own relationship with God, you know, I became one of those that said, no, you don't, have to do, you don't even have to close your eyes. You, you know, you don't have to do anything. Listen, you don't have to, but there is a posture of submission when someone kneels. There's like this posture of saying, God, I'm lowering myself and I'm raising you higher. It's not religion. It's in relationship that I'm doing this. It's, it's not because I'm scared you're going to strike me down, but it's because I want to make my own thoughts less and I want to make your thoughts way more relevant to my life. Kneeling for prayer is something beautiful. Even prostrating yourself on the floor is something that, that the priests and, the, and David did continually. He goes down with his, both hands and his face on the floor. Not because he was scared God was going to judge him, but because he created such an honor in his life. Not just with what he was saying, but he, he showed it. Do it in your prayer closet. Do it at home. Do it wherever you can. If we can get back to a place where God is honored the way He's supposed to be, I believe His word and His instructions will become way more relevant in our lives also. The fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord versus the fear of man. So today we are on the second mountain peak. Um, and what we will call this one is uh, work ethic or drive, or we can call it motivation. It is basically the diligent person versus the lazy person. Now, I think, or I hope, oh no, I don't hope. I mean, I hope, I hope you don't squirm while we're going to go through some of these verses. Might get a little bit uncomfortable. Because... These verses that we're going to look at, it's like a mirror where I don't think there's a person here that can say, oh, that's not me. I think we all have some form of what he's going to talk about here. We all have this, the, this, this idea of laziness. Now, what is laziness? Let me give you a definition. Laziness is showing a lack of effort or energy. The unwillingness to act, and this is a big part, or even care. This is when it gets to extreme. There's the first part of I'm unwilling to act, and then when it comes to the place of being an extreme thing in your life, I'm even unwilling to care. I don't care anymore. Now, here's the thing. Many would consider laziness. Like, why on earth would you preach on laziness in church? Like, it's trivial. It's petty. I mean, it's not that bad. Who really cares about la laziness? You know, come, you know, is laziness really a thing for God? The Bible says it very, very clearly. The Bible has a significant amount of information in regards to laziness. And the reason is laziness affects others. It affects the people around you. Now remember, what, what do we want to be? We want to become a people 
who are experts at living well. So if Solomon addresses laziness as something that is significant, it means that if you have laziness in you, it means that you are not an expert at living well. You are lacking in certain areas. So what I want to do is I want to affect those areas with the Word. So uh, if you are familiar with the term uh, couch potato, like we know that, right? Or here's another term known for uh, sofa spud. Yeah, it's a sofa spud. Um, a sofa spud is somebody who is unmotivated, one who spends presumably most of his or her time watching television or nowadays Instagram reels, TikTok. You just, all you do is you sit and you scroll up. You don't move. You sit in the same spot the whole day, spending hours, wasting hours of your life just scrolling. There's a website that I found. It's called Couch Potato which tells you which shows you can binge watch and which one flows the best from the one into the other. Some of you are sadly actually writing that down. <laughs> I can see some of you make, taking a note. Couch potato. Didn't know about that one. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Here are a few things that every couch potato will understand. Now see if you find yourself in this. First of all, a couch potato understands the following. The desperation you feel when you realize you lost your remote. Right? Or it's on the counter over there and I just sat down. It's like, how am I going to get there? Right? The panic that ensues when you realize your phone battery dropped to below 20% and your charger is all the way upstairs. Like, there's just panic. This one, contemplating using your shirt as a napkin. In order to avoid getting up and getting one while you're eating chicken wings and nachos. The, the amount of concentration, couch potatoes, you'll know this one. It takes to balance a plate on your stomach while you actually have to use your stomach muscles just to keep it there. And this one, finally, I think this is probably the biggest nightmare one out of all of them. When you realize you have held out so long from going to the bathroom that you probably might not make it all the way there. <laughs> yeah, couch potatoes, yeah. And I, I know some of you are laughing because it's a laugh of guilt. You know, it's you. <laughs> I know that. Uh, yeah. Except for the plate on the stomach. <laughs> yeah, use a pillow on top of it, yes. <laughs> Now, listen, God's got nothing against relaxing. I want you to hear me. God's got nothing against relaxing. I know some of these examples are things that we all do. We all dread. Like, like you know, if I know the remote is in the kitchen counter over there, and I, and I put it there, and I just sat down. I'm thinking, why did I do that? You know, we, I know and I understand that there, there's things like relaxing, and it's important to relax. The Bible talks about rest. It's important. But the problem is laziness is not just something that is in the moment. It's something that becomes a habit that is so drastic that you stop caring. And that's what God, He doesn't want that. The Bible addresses this head on. Did you know that in Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, what was the sin that God judged them for? How many of you know? Violence? What else? Moral immorality? Yeah? Yeah? You know what's written about it? Ezekiel 16, 49. Sodom was judged for laziness. An abundance of idleness. An abundance of not caring. That's amazing. And laziness, this term, it also has an older um, version of the term. The term is the word sloth. Like sloth, sloth. It's an intriguing word because this word sloth actually shows up in an ancient list of sins that predates white collar sins. Um, the list of sins is, they were written down in 600 AD and they were called the seven deadly sins. Seven deadly sins. It's not the TV show. It's way before the TV show. Um, it's a list that was compiled by the Catholic Church um, and they were called the capital vices. They were called the cardinal sins. So these seven sins, they were so severe in the church that they felt if you had any one of these sins, these sins were unforgivable sins. So if you had these, like judgments yours, 
Now, we know they had that completely wrong because Jesus died for all our sins. They, the only sin that the Bible speaks of um, that is unforgivable is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Right? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, when he speaks about death, just so you understand, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit convicts you of Jesus Christ being your Lord and, Lord and Savior, and the rejection of him is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. It's when I reject that. That's the sin that is unforgivable. Because when you accept Christ, all your sins are forgiven. So it's important to know. So he's got these seven deadly sins um, that they, they mention, 600 AD. The sins were the following. Pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath, anger, and sloth, laziness. Unforgivable sins based on the church 600 years after Jesus' passing and resurrection. Now, nowadays, today, we look at laziness and we go, you know, it's not that bad, really. I mean, laziness is like an acceptable sin. It's okay to be lazy, right? It, it's what's really the big deal about a lazy person. Um, there's a term that's called respectable sins that's used in culture. It's also used in church culture, unfortunately. And there are, they've created a list of respectable sins in the church. You can go and read up on it. The respectable sins are the following. Gossip. Why? Because if you think about how much gossip happens, we don't want to confront it. We don't want to stop it. We don't want to cause anybody to not do it. Because it's just, it's just a little whisper. Right? It's just, uh, I'm not really doing any damage with it. Second one, selfishness. This is not just a respectable sin right now. This is an encouraging, like people are encouraging people to be more selfish. Bitterness. Whoa. Bitterness. Right now, bitterness is, man, you should own it. And if you don't want to own your bitterness towards somebody who's not for you or might have a different opinion for you, I will harvest bitterness on your behalf. You don't have to be bitter or upset or offended. I will be offended for you. Anger, gluttony, prayerlessness, envy, and laziness. Sins that are not so serious, sins that we accept. Now, looking at the book of Proverbs, Proverbs deals with this. So, so the, the phrase laziness, to deal with laziness, comes up 19 times in 19 different verses. So he speaks towards it very directly. And here's the thing about wisdom, which I want all of us to understand. You can only apply it to you. As a pastor, or when somebody preaches or, or when you're teaching, I can't tell you how many times I've had people come to me and say, Oh, you know, man, I wish that person was here. Oh, I wish that person was here. And then when they say that to me, I'm thinking, man, I was so glad you were here. <laughs> because this message was for you. It's for you. And it's the same with wisdom. Wisdom is for you. You have to apply this if you want to be an expert at living, living life the way God wants us to live it. Now, the difference between a diligent person and a lazy person, chapters uh, Proverbs 6, 6, 6, Proverbs, not 6, 6, 6, Proverbs 6, chapter 6, says the following, go to the ant, you sluggard. Man, I love that word. You know, there are certain words that just pack a punch. Like, I think this word is one of those, um, I wrote this down because I, I don't know how to say it in English, but it is an onomatopoetic word. Thank you very much. In Afrikaans, it is onomatopoetic. Onumatuputia, right? Onumatuputia. Everybody say that. Onumatuputia. Yeah. How hard is that one? And the Afrikaans word is beautiful for sluggard. Slock. Go to the ant, you slock. Isn't that just so expressive? I love it. It's like I don't think they could have picked a, a better word. The modern day translation wanted to, um, they wanted to, it to feel a little bit more, more, more soothing, so they translated it as lazy bones. It's not the same. Slug, lazy bones. I mean, how can you compare those two? You can't. Sluggard. He goes, go, go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no captain 
Overseer or ruler provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you slumber, O oh sluggard, slack? What will, when will you rise up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So your poverty will come upon you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. As believers, we should be concerned Not just about what occupation we have, but we should be concerned about the kind of worker I am. Let me tell you something about work. Because I hear this a lot also. I hear a lot of people say to me, you know what, work is part of the curse. Right, when Adam sinned, work stepped in. And I've been redeemed from the curse. (laughs) Right, therefore I will just name it and claim it. That's my car. No, it's not. Somebody else is driving it. You have to understand what the curse was and what the curse is not. And you need to dig a little bit deeper into your Bible because if you do that, what you will discover is work was something that began way before the fall of man. It's the first thing God did to Adam after he created him is he gave him a job. He said to him, what I want you to do is, I want you to guard and keep the garden. This is your instruction. This is your job. This is what you have to do. So what is the curse that came upon man? It says, on the, by the sweat of your brow, work will become super hard. Work will become something that is exhausting and tiring. And it will, uh, and I know for, <laughs> many people feel this way, it feels like it drains your soul. If you're in that job, um, I am so sorry. Because I do believe that we have been redeemed from that also. Which simply means if that is how you feel in your workplace right now, you can redeem your work also. How do you redeem your work? By applying God's principles in the work that you are currently doing. Not by quitting. Applying His principles in the work that you are currently doing. Start serving others, start loving others, and you will see how your whole work environment will change. But we do have an enemy that wants to make our lives a little bit more uncomfortable and harder. And we have to recognize that also. But I also know that when we do the work and when we walk with God in our purpose, not just in our occupation, but in our purpose at work, We are redeemed from the curse because what happens? There is a harvest that comes in because of us being there. But if you are not there, if you're searching for the remote between the seats, you're not being effective. And work becomes an absolute curse. Work is important. Even when you're retired, all the retired people, hey, how are you doing? (laughs) You know, I can't find it scripturally that we retire. I can't. Can't find it. Which means you are required. Which means you are required to continue serving and working in the kingdom. It does not stop. It does not stop. You're not done yet, Mr. Anderson. So as we compare the diligent to the lazy, let me tell you a couple of things about lazy bones and the sluggard. Number one, and David, you're a hunter. Oh, where's David Mueller? You're a hunter? Do you like hunting? Iffy. Okay. Okay. So a wannabe hunter. Okay. So Proverbs 12, 27 says the following, the lazy man does not roast what he took in the hunting. Now you have to imagine this. So you've got a guy that is so lazy. He catches something in the hunt, but he's too lazy to take it home, work it, and eat it. That's very lazy. Another lazy one. It gets worse. Second telltale of a mark of a lazy person. Not only will he not finish the things he started, but he won't face things as they are. He always has excuses. He won't really face things head on. It's too cold. Oh, it's too hot. Oh, it's too dangerous. Oh, I don't know that area. That's too risky for me. 
that's too hard. That's just not me. You don't understand me. Proverbs 22, 13, if you think I'm making this up, let me show you. A lazy man says, now listen, a lazy man says, there is a lion outside. I shall be slain in the street. Who says that? The person doesn't want to go outside. They don't want to get up and do anything. They make up excuses. There's a lion outside. I might get killed if I get up and do something. What makes it even worse is that their lies become their reality. Same with isolation and thinking that you can do things on your own and you can just be at home. And to all of those watching online, really love you. No, I do. I really love you. I'm thankful that you are following us online. Um, I'm thankful that you are hungry for the word. But come on, man. You got to get back to church. Whatever excuse you had before, it's an excuse. I'll tell you the, the definition for an excuse in a, in a bit. An excuse is a reason. It's dressed up like a reason, but it contains a lie. And whatever your reasons are for being at home right now, I simply don't think it's valid anymore. I just don't. Your church needs you. People need you. Isolation is an absolute lie, and the enemy wants to isolate us. If he can get you alone. When was Jesus tempted when he was on his own for 40 days and 40 nights? Isolation is not something that we should be for. It's something that we as a church body actually should be against. Because it damages and it hurts people. We should be around people. So that we can influence them and love them. Now I do want to say again, I don't think that there, is, uh, that there aren't any excuses. I think there are reasons. I think there are reasons for... for not necessarily going out and doing everything that you can, but, but when an excuse becomes um, something that eliminates all serving of the body or serving people from your life, that's an excuse because no matter what state you are in, unless you are unconscious, let's say there it's a little bit hard, but unless you are there, you have the ability to serve and love people. Do not allow your excuse to become something that, that limits your, your service to people. Uh, Proverbs 20 verse 4 says the following, The lazy man will not plow because of winter. Here's another reason. I won't plow because it's cold. He will beg during harvest and have nothing. This is the person who's not only is he lazy, but he rationalizes his laziness. He's always got the excuse. Some of us, unfortunately... And I think culture has done this also. It's trained up our children to be a generation that's lazy. And, and perfect example, blue ribbons. Doesn't matter how hard you've worked. Doesn't matter if, if you work 10 times as hard as everybody else. You get the same reward. Then the kid that didn't do anything, didn't try anything, didn't put any effort in. For me, that reward is creating a culture of, oh, I'm going to get the same reward as the guy that works hard. Why on earth would I work hard? What's the sense? And it's across the board. I'm not just talking about sports or hockey or soccer. or in. It's across the board with, with um, culture. Let's just reward everybody the same. It's nonsense. The Bible does not work that way. Do you know that when you go to heaven, that there will be different levels of where we are going to be? Not everybody enters in and have the same mandate and the same level. So, so thinking that God is not a rewarder, He is a rewarder. Which means we have to be diligent with our work. Okay, so I'm going to give you the definition of an excuse again. It's got the skin of a reason, but it's stuffed with a lie. I love that. An excuse has the skin of a reason, but it's stuffed with a lie. 
Now, I'm going to finish just with this last example. Compare the person always looking, um, uh, the person who's always looking for an excuse to do bad work. Like, the person who always has a reason um, why his work is not where it's supposed to be. I hope it's not you. Uh, you know, the person who uh, plays a lot of, let's say, video games, spends hours on Instagram, social media, wastes time and a number of exercises. Compare that person who wastes the hours in his day and just hands it in because I have to hand something in. There's no pride in that. Compare that to this amazing man called Antonio Stradivarius. For those of you that heard of him, he was a violin maker. Why do we love his instruments so much? Why do violinists pay over a million dollars to play one of his violins? Why is it treasured so much? Because Antonio lived with the idea that music was a gift from God. And if he didn't make the very best instruments, people would be deprived of God's music. That's a mindset which we should have. So he put all his energy and his effort into learning about wood, about the resonance, shaving it at different spots to make sure that the instrument would play the very best of God's music to the world. I want when people hear my violin to be inspired in such a way that they experience God in the playing. How's that for motivation? And that's for every area of our life. Let me bring it back home to us. <laughs> Very lightheartedly, when we have a church barbecue and we are given the mandate that each of us have to serve somebody else food, you bring a bowl. Don't bring your leftovers. If you understand what I mean, you want to, like when I cook food, when I bless people with food, I want them to absolutely love it. I like cooking. I like food. So when I serve people something like that, and it's the same with the mindset, and I'm saying it's a very practical, very simple, practical thing. When you bring a bowl of something and you know you're going to serve 250 other people and your bowl is just going to serve 20 people, you want the 20 people that's going to eat from your bowl to go, who did that? Like, who, who put that together? Because you can feel they spent time on it and effort and they cared about it. It's the same about our lives and how we impact and influence people around us. Who put that together? When, when you, if you work at Starbucks, if, if you work at Safeway or Savon or as an accountant or as an electrician or as a builder or whatever you are in, people must look at your work and go, wow, who did that? Because there were care and effort that they placed into it. And that's where we should live. We should live as a people that show that we care. We want to reflect God in everything. You are not an afterthought. You are not a burden. You are not a second-class citizen that I feel I can just serve you up anything. I want to give you my best. I want to give you my best every single time because I represent a father who gave us his best. Worship team, you can come up, please. So the four themes that, that we are looking at, the first one is the fear of the Lord. The second one is laziness. And the reason why I want to focus on laziness is because as a body and as a church, we can become complacent in the sense of thinking, well, the church and the pastors should organize everything. They should bring people to God. They should be the ones that create the events where people will come and then they will lead them to God and then they will make them disciples and then they will get their children going and then they will, and that is a lazy church. We should not be a lazy church. We should be a church that is actively involved in the people around us in their lives to the point where we lead them to Christ. You lead them. You lead them to God. We come a, become a body where they plug in and we feed them. We do everything we possibly can to make sure that they mature in their faith and in their walk with God. But you lead them there. 
The church has become complacent. We have. And David and um, Saul and God in the book of, and Abraham, they speak against a lazy people. Do not become slaves of this world thinking that somebody else is going to do it for you. Church, we have to be the church that makes the influence, that brings the difference. And I call on every single one of you. Let go of that lazy thought of thinking the church is responsible. You are. You're responsible for your neighbors, for your family members, for your friends. Be intentional in reaching them. Be proactive in your thinking. Serve them with excellence. And I know that you're going to influence their hearts and their lives. And the kingdom of God will expand because of it. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. And God, again, it's practical. You you give us practical things in our lives which we have to apply so that we can be your people, that when people look at us, they recognize you. They see you. And you are not a lazy God. You didn't stop halfway through making Adam. Oh, that will do. You said that you thought us through. Every part of us, you knit together with intention, details. You know our names. You know our thoughts. You know who we are. We aren't mass produced. Every single individual here, Father, you know us by our names. And Father, I pray that the intensity and the the intention that you put into us, that we will have that same willingness to make an impact in our friends and in our neighbors, in our family, in our children's lives, that we won't expect somebody else to do it for us, but that we will take up the mandate that you've given us to do your work and to see it fulfilled. We thank you that we are your people. We thank you that you love us and that you care about us. And we thank you that your plans for us are good. We call your people out of their seats into action. In Jesus Christ's wonderful name we pray. Amen.